Hey guys, thanks so much for uh, sticking with us so far. This interview is perhaps one of our favorites. David Beanenstock, he's the author of How to Smoke Pop Properly, A Highbrow Guide to Getting High. He's also co-creator of the podcast Great Moments in Weed History with Abdullah and Bean. Previously, he served as head of content at High Times and was a frequent contributor and video host and producer at Vice Media, where he co-produced the series Bong at Petit including viral episodes like a gourmet weed dinner at Hunter S. Thompson's house and Marijuana Nona. A contributor to Vice, Leafly, GQ, The Guardian, and other publications, he has been profiled by The New Yorker, Vanity Fair, The Los Angeles Times, Rolling Stone, LA Weekly, Slate, and elsewhere. And the Potswoggy Moms. (laughs) While making frequent (laughs) media appearances, including on CNN, NPR, Emmy, MSNBC, HBO, and Fox News. We really hope you enjoy this interview as much as we did. Here it is. This book has been amazing like it's it's got it's not just how to smoke pot properly you basically go through cannabis history down to genetics of 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 cannabis growing cannabis edibles different ways to do it even how to host a dinner a dinner party with it how is this basically a culmination of all the years that you've been in this industry and everything you've learned Yeah, I would say, you know, how to smoke pot properly is a bit of a, you know, tongue in cheek uh, joke as as long as uh, smoke is going in and coming out and you're not coughing too much and you get high, you're definitely doing it right. Uh, But I I just wanted to write something that would reflect, uh, you know, all the experiences I had as a cannabis reporter, all the people that I met, lessons I learned from them and really try to share them with people, whether they've been, you know, smoking weed a long time or they're new to the culture and just kind of reflect where this community is at right now, which is, uh, I think, a pretty interesting moment where we have a lot of places where it's legal. We have places where it's still full on prohibition. Uh, We have a tremendous understanding of the medicinal value of the plant. And we have tremendous ignorance and stigma and oppression and racism from uh, the government in certain places. And so everything is really in flux. Um, But we have never been stronger as a cannabis community and and just uh, wanted to share what I've learned and experienced firsthand with people and encourage people to, you know, really look at this weed community as something to be proud of, something to share with others, something to, you know, uh, represent in your life in a positive way. And, uh, you know, I've gotten great feedback from the book. I really appreciate your kind words about it. And, um, you know, same thing with the podcast on Great Moments in Weed History. We're looking back at the history of this culture and again, trying to make sure that we tell our own stories and don't allow this history to be erased or rewritten or obscured by uh, the same institutions and the same powers that be that have subjected us to this terrible prohibition for so long. Yeah, and I, uh, I I really think that even if you have been smoking for a really long time, like you, there's so much to learn. There's so many parts of it that uh, we learn on a regular basis, even, you know, us. Yeah, you, you mentioned actually in the book how like not until you got your job at High Times, all you really knew about weed was basically the same thing all I knew about weed until we started this podcast. <laughs> Which was like, oh, there's good weed and bad weed, like reggies and, and crippy. Well, you said kind bud. We call it crippy down here in Florida. Uh, that was my experience growing up with cannabis. But then you started working at High Times and you started really learning about the culture. How much, like, first, when did you start consuming cannabis? And tell us your story about that and how you got into the industry and how all that changed. Sure. Oh, it's interesting you mentioned crippies because we, we had an episode of Great Moments in Weed History, my podcast with my partner, Abdullah Saeed, where we, we traced the history of OG Kush and, and found out that this sort of classic West Coast strain really comes from Florida and was known at one time as Crippy. So <laughs> uh, it all ties together. I, I, I started uh, smoking weed when I was a teenager. It really had a profound effect on myself and on my life. Uh, and then 
it became a job for me uh, when, well, you know, the occasional eighth of weed here and there that I might may or may not have sold to some people, <laughs> but uh, it became a career uh, when I started working at High Times. That was in New York City. That was back when High Times was an independent publication. I don't really uh, fuck with them now, uh, <laughs> but but back at that time, it was an incredible place to you know, work for a publication that was dedicated to telling the truth about this plant. And, uh, you know, as you mentioned, there's so much to learn and so many different aspects to it, whether you're looking at the medicinal properties, whether you're looking at the in inequalities and injustice in the criminal justice system around cannabis, whether you're looking at infusing it as a food, whether you're learning how to grow it as a plant, whether you're learning about the chemistry of the plant itself or how it affects art and culture. So, you know, there's so many different aspects to this, so much to learn. And most importantly, I think just I'm fascinated by the people that I meet through this plant. And I always feel most comfortable when I'm surrounded by the culture, you know, uh, even just living in New York City for a long time before it was legal, you go to a party or an event, there's always a second party out on a fire escape up on the roof down on the street where people are getting together to smoke. And, you know, I think for everything bad about the marginalization and the stigma around this plant, it also made us a really strong culture because we were uh, pushed into the margins and we threw a party there. Yeah, for sure. We definitely set ourselves apart from all the drinkers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then that's the thing is that um, there's still a large stigma around being a cannabis consumer, especially if you're in a non-legal state. <clears throat> so it's really important that we have conversations like this. And you got into the industry and at an early part, it was not even recreationally legal anywhere yet. Um, how did your family feel about you going that route in your in your career? You know, it was like, how, how did they take it? Uh, well, I would say, you know, getting caught having weed uh, as a young person didn't go over so well. Getting a job uh, with a national publication you know, by that time, it, it, it seemed like one of the better outcomes for me uh, <laughs> based on my trajectory in life. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm actually, it's, it's very satisfying to me. I'm in a place now where my mom is, you know, still no matter how many times I, I recommend it to her as a medicine is not uh, yet made that decision, but she's learned a lot about the plant. She's completely... Uh, uh, supports me and in, in, in my journalism and my work and you know has come to understand that she herself uh, was the victim of propaganda and lies about this plant and uh, has come to see it in a new light and I would just say to anybody who's listening you know you on the one hand uh, you, you don't need your family's approval uh, if this is something that is important to you, whether medicinally, recreationally, socially, you know, you know the benefits that you're getting from the plant and you don't need anybody else to affirm that for you. That's what this wonderful community is for. On the other hand, don't ever give up on that aunt, on that uncle, on your on your family members, uh, particularly when it comes to the medicinal use of this plant, because... Um, whether it's now or down the line, somebody, you know, among your loved ones is going to have a condition where this plant can be very, very helpful for them. And you may not be able to convince them to try it, but you do have a responsibility to share that information with them, even if it's in an uncomfortable conversation, even if it is not legal where they live, because and just as one example, going through chemotherapy without cannabis um, is horrible. You know, I've seen in my work uh, so many people who have benefited tremendously from this plant. Um, so you always, uh, if you know the truth, you, you always want to hold that door open for people. And it might take a lot of conversations to change their mind. 
Yeah, we actually that we have a well, I have conservative Cuban <laughs> family. So, yeah, at, at the beginning, we had started this podcast. We didn't want to. We didn't even show our face. Yeah, we, we we didn't want we we didn't think we needed to. And then it came a point in time where we were talking more about it. And we we're like, how can we advocate for a plan if we're not willing to even like put ourselves out there, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know? And so we kind of started having the uncomfortable conversations with our family that we didn't think we'd have, you know, and because we're adults now, we're not getting caught with weed anymore. Like now you've you've seen us become responsible parents and become wonderful parents at that. Like now that we tell you that we you know, we use weed like it shouldn't really change your opinion on us because, you know, that we've been thriving. So it's difficult. You know, my mom is still kind of like judging me for it but like you know it's i rather have been open and tell you know tell her and and let her know hey i'm having success in this field then like keep that from her but still facing the backlash of all of that recording and all of that you know anything anytime happen anything happens were you stoned right or you know (laughs) yeah and i tried to get her to use it too and she but you almost did. you got her to eat a half a gummy. Yeah, so. that's using it. <laughs> how, how did that go? Well, I was like, I thought it, she was like, is is anything supposed to have? I was like, mom, eat half a half a gummy. Watch your Netflix like she, you have no, nothing to do. Just chill. You can right? go over that in the book, introducing somebody to cannabis for the first time. I mean, this book goes over everything. Yeah. <laughs> Little by little, she didn't feel anything. I said, well, just little by little. And I don't know. I never I I had a really hard day once and I was like, I'm going to have a gummy. And she was like, you bitch, stop that shit. And I was just like, what? It's confusing. Yeah, it's really hard for people to sort of un, un, unwrap that and and. You know, people have been so, especially, you know, older generations, there was no counter narrative. They were really pounded with this uh, propaganda, uh, every 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 lie about this plant. And even as we, you know, continue to evolve as a society, it, it, it's ingrained in people. And so I would just say, you know, um, don't push people too hard. You know, when when somebody's resistance is is really, really up, sometimes you just got to say, okay, you know, we'll we'll talk about it another time. And you'd be surprised how people come around. And, um, you know, I I do want to give a shout out in in Florida to uh, somebody we did an episode of Great Moments in Weed History about. He was a a weed smuggler known as Black Tuna, and he ended up doing 30 years for a nonviolent smuggling charge. Uh, But when he got out, he started something called the Silver Tour, and he went from uh, retirement community to retirement community, talking to seniors, explaining the medicinal benefits, explaining uh, the lies about the plant, and and really, I think, did a lot to help start that conversation among seniors. And now, right now, we see that while seniors are the demographic most likely to be opposed to legalization, they're also changing their minds faster than anybody else about it and using cannabis uh, at, a, at a higher rate. You know, more and more seniors every year are, are discovering particularly the medicinal uh, benefits of the plant because when, when you get to a certain age, um, it's, good, it's good for what ails you. And that might be something relatively manageable like arthritis or just... Uh, chronic pain. Uh, But, you know, when we compare it to the pharmaceutical drugs that are so often prescribed and over prescribed for older people, uh, those are the ones that, of course, have really serious side effects. Those are the ones that can be habit forming. Those are the ones that you can fatally overdose on in in a worst case scenario. Um, So, you know, when you really look at the facts, uh, it, it's an argument that you can make to anybody. And of course, you know, like I said, it's your responsibility to try to open the door for the people in your life. It is not your responsibility to change their minds and you don't need their permission or their affirmation to 
have your own relationship with this plant and get the benefits from it. So, yeah, you don't even have to tell Abuelita. Like, you don't have Abuel- to tell Abuelita her. Abuelita doesn't know. My dad, my mom, everybody knows, but my grandmother just does not. He doesn't know. Even then, you're right. They, they are the ones that could benefit the most. Here in Florida, it's only medicinally legal. And when I go into the dispensary, I do see a lot of yeah, senior there, people. Yeah, definitely. There. Mm-hmm. There's a lot and more. And they're there asking questions and trying different things. And I love it every time I see it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and we need to get somebody in Century Village where my mom lives. <laughs> you should actually have you should have one of the dispensaries go out there and do a, a educational outreach. Right? Mm-hmm. You should. Yeah, well, if you reach out to this uh, gentleman, Robert Platshorn, Black Tuna, um, if you can get a crowd of people together, you know, if you can get somebody to host the event, uh, you know, he he loves nothing more than than to speak to groups of seniors. So um, it'd be good to have a Spanish speaker, too, if he. <laughs> oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, we have. a. Uh huh. <laughs> but uh, that would be very interesting. It, it would it would definitely help out a lot. A lot of uh, elderly people definitely here in Florida. It's fucking crazy here. Like it's uh, awful here. Even just uh, for anxiety. Uh, like, yeah. Take a gummy and watch Netflix. It's Florida. Everybody knows how crazy it is. Yeah. And you know, just our medical marijuana program is kind of a mess. I don't know if you're familiar. We have the vertical integration here. So the only way you can really be a part of this industry is if you're a multi-million air company, a corporation. You just it's it's almost impossible for any small businesses to yeah. get into it. And you see bigger and it's been happening lately a lot. You see the bigger companies start eating up and buying all the the smaller dispensaries and stuff. Do you what do you think about corporate cannabis and how do we how can we change that? Like, I feel like we have to get it right, because once it's written into the law, like it's really tough to go back and change things. Yeah, absolutely. That's a that's a huge issue for me. And and something we talk a lot about on Great Moments in Weed History, because we're looking back at the history, but it all reflects on where we're at now and where we want to go in the future. And, um, you know, the, the the book I wrote, I wrote, I think, five or six years ago, and there's a section in it that says uh, cannabis should transform capitalism, not the other way around. And when we look at this intersection of cannabis and capitalism, you know, we see everything bad that has happened to small family farmers and that has happened to small business in this country over the last 50 years is happening in cannabis very, very rapidly because for everything that was terrible about prohibition, it did sort of keep these big institutional investors at bay. It kept big business and corporate and corporations away. Um, and now, of course, all of that money is flooding in. Uh, and, and one thing I try to explain to people is like, you know, ending these arrests and making sure that everyone has access to this plant is the most important thing. Um, you know, I've been reporting on cannabis for about 20 years and countless stories of people who've had their lives torn apart by uh, a cannabis arrest, uh, you know, everything from going to prison to having their children taken away to having their home raided in the middle of the night to simply, you know, losing a job, uh, all of these terrible outcomes. Uh, and when we legalize cannabis, we stop those arrests. And that is by far the most important thing. But we don't want to stop there. We want to make a cannabis industry that creates opportunities for everyone to participate. And in particular, that can undo some of the damage of these racist laws that targeted people of color, that targeted people with less money, that targeted young people um, and, and turn it around and create a new kind of industry that works for consumers, that works for uh, working class people, that is a ladder up for communities who have bore the brunt of the war on drugs. Um, But that is not going to be easy. And I just also want to make the point to people like, if you see this happening to cannabis and you care a lot about cannabis, understand that's capitalism. And, and, and so look at 
capitalism as a force that is at you know affecting you in every aspect of your life um and just because we legalize cannabis and push it into the mainstream economy does not mean it's going to be necessarily any different than uh how big business operates whether it's big pharma or uh you know pepsi cola so when you live in a place and legalization is coming you need to not only advocate for ending arrests but for the creation of a cannabis industry that safeguards small business and that creates opportunities for the communities uh, most negatively impacted by the war on drugs. The good news is in some of the states that have most recently legalized, for instance, uh, I grew up in New Jersey. I lived in New York City for a long time. Those laws are much better than some of the laws that were passed just two or three years ago. They're quite reflective of at least that desire. Uh, but still, at the end of the day, uh, you know, as my mom likes to say, and many other people, money talks and bullshit walks. And so we have to understand that this is going to be an ongoing fight. And the best thing that you can do as a consumer is to vote with your dollars to if you have an opportunity to buy cannabis from the kinds of businesses that you want to see flourish make sure you do that be savvy find out who is growing your cannabis where and how um, and look for opportunities to support small business mom and pops people of color you know, whatever is particularly important to you or something that's grown organically, something that's grown outdoors as opposed to indoors under, uh, you know, very intense lights that have a huge impact on the environment. Um, we can make these kinds of decisions every time we buy weed and we can also lobby our local uh, elected officials and make sure that they hear from us directly because big business is always going to have their ear. You know, I, I don't want to get into the details of the laws in Florida. I know you probably know them better than I do, but, you know, those laws were written by lobbyists in order to make money for politically well-connected people. And it's a shame, uh, but it's not the end of the story. You know, we can continue to push to change these laws. In your opinion, um, how far do you think we are from actually it being federally either legalized or decriminalized? We we know that there's several different bills in the works, you know, yeah. there's the Moore Act and then there's the the CO, whatever, Chuck the one Schumer, Schumer and Booker yeah. have. And then the GOP have their own. It seems like everybody's trying to get something done, but nobody's they're not working together to get it passed. So realistically, do you think federally federal legalization or decriminalization is going to happen anytime soon uh it's you know everyone who <laughs> is on the record making predictions about that ends up uh eating their words so <laughs> us included <laughs> yeah. yeah i think i said within the next two, two years, years. Uh -huh. yeah so i i think that you know it's always important to look forward um but looking at anything as being inevitable is counterproductive um we need to, you know, just keep pushing and keep fighting. And also, you know, when it comes to federal legalization, it's going to be all about the details. Mm -hmm. um, because if we get a federal legalization law that is written to completely favor uh, big corporate entities, um, we, we may not get what we want out of it. And, um, you know, so I, I think what's most important for people to understand is you can have the biggest impact where you live locally and you you know can focus on the details of the law where you live your elected officials when it comes to washington dc you know the one thing i just do want to say to people is like i share everyone's disappointment in the lack of progress out of our current administration um, I'm not somebody who is a, a big fan of either major political party in this country, 
but sometimes there's this misconception that it doesn't matter which party you vote for on this weed issue but every time it comes up for a vote you know we see the vast majority of democrats in support of legalization and the vast majority of republicans against it so i just do like to point that out because there's a lot of misinformation around that um but in terms of what's going to happen when uh you know all you all you can do is follow the bills as they move along and, and understand we have a very uh dysfunctional political system on any issue and so you know progress is going to be difficult to come by but the momentum is certainly uh in our direction i would be like they took our right away uh to have abortions but they're gonna legalize weed that would be like kind of weird though too right <laughs> like yeah but um need i mean either way like you know we'll still be championing for it uh you know all the advocating for it and doing what we can but you're uh, right you hit the nail on the head what's important is your local politics your local politicians you need to focus you need to get the the people locally elected to represent our state and at the end of the day they're gonna leave it up to the state anyway Mm -hmm. so -hmm. wherever you live that's gonna be the law of the land for you regardless of what the you know federally yeah and and that's you know I, i as i say you you have a real you know and, and the other thing is you don't have to do this work by yourself wherever you live there's going to be uh, groups of people who are organized around this um, some groups to check out our normal national organization for the reform of marijuana laws if you're a younger person students for sensible drug policy is an excellent organization um, and you're going to find groups local to the state where you live in all too often the people who are well organized are the business lobbies increasingly and so while they're going to push for legalization they're going to push for their version of it a, a great example of this is home grow mm-hmm. to me that is a basic human right um i should and you should and everyone should have the right to grow this plant certainly for personal use and so when we see a law that's passed that says okay this plant is now legal but you can't grow it yourself well that's really just there to protect the business community Mm -hmm. because it forces you to go to the dispensary and pay a really really high premium i mean i I don't know if you've ever had the opportunity to grow your own cannabis but you know where i live in california you can grow six plants i smoke a lot of weed uh but with not much space with very little money put into it uh i can grow all the weed that i need for a year quite easily enough to share with other people Mm -hmm. enough to trade with other people and say oh let me try the strains that you're growing and you can try some of mine and it's it not only saves you money it's 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 a wonderful way to be connected to the plant it also helps you know how this was grown that there weren't any um you know chemicals used as fertilizers that you wouldn't want to use um you know and uh, you can grow really excellent cannabis yourself uh the other thing is it's not going to be shipped and packaged and handled by a million people so you know if we understand that the uh medicinal and the uh part of the plant that gets you high are are these very delicate little crystals uh that that you can sometimes see with the naked eye sometimes see with a with a micro uh microscope um well now imagine that getting sort of trimmed on machines and uh going down an assembly line and getting chopped up and put into packages and then you know in some states sitting uh has to go to a lab it has to go to a storage facility it has to get shipped all over the place it's it's often not climate controlled so at every step in the process uh that cannabis is degrading in quality versus Mm -hmm. having a beautiful plant in your backyard you wake up in the morning if you're me have a cup of coffee water the plants talk to them sing to them have a relationship with them um that's all wonderful and you can end up with some really beautiful 
fragrant, sticky, high potency cannabis at when I say a fraction of the cost of the dispensary, it's really pennies uh, on the dollar. And it's and it's, you know, if, if you like most of us have have grown up uh, in your weed life with a weed budget, uh, uh, this plant is, is so ex unfortunately <laughs> expensive. I'm about to have a weed budget. <laughs> <laughs> I'm about to have one. It's getting there. <laughs> And we get um, pretty good discounts and I'm still <laughs> going to have to. Yeah. So, so to sort of decommodify the plant. Um, and that's another uh, real way to push back against this corporatization, because if everyone is able to grow and everybody, uh, you know, not everyone can or wants to, you know, it's, it's legal almost everywhere to brew your own beer, but most people don't do it. Uh, the difference is growing weed is pretty easy under the right circumstances. Unfortunately, you know, not everybody has a backyard. Unfortunately, not everybody um, is a homeowner. You know, I, I, I'm a renter, but I have a small yard, so I'm able to put six plants out. But the more people who grow this plant, the more abundance there will be, and it will be a lot harder to charge so much for it. Um, because you may have a friend who grows it and, and is happy to share with you, or you can be that friend and, and share it with your friends and your loved ones. That sounds so magical. I mean, how awesome is it? Like if you're someone that grows cannabis and you have other friends that do, and you guys can Dude, get together. You, listen, I have a hey, let me try in Canada. I have a weird, we have, we share the same love of beastie boys. So I call her my beastie bestie. She's out in Canada. She has like little get togethers with her friends and they all bring their buds their and harvest. they all share yes it's a dream people they're living the dream i know us over here we're fighting to try to get home grow um right now there's um a petition going to try to get an amendment added to our ballot um and it would allow home grow it would legalize it but it would restrict it to nine plants um there's people in the community that don't want any restrictions of course you know because why have any any rules around it that's going to possibly still get somebody arrested or in trouble for something that's supposed to be legal. Um, what are your opinions about the limits they have? And in California, do they have any rules about like access? Like, does it have to be behind a locked gate or anything like that? Some of those rules are, are, are local to your county um, or even the city that you might live in. Uh, it, it's like if it was up to me, if I was the commissioner of weed, it would be legal the way that tomatoes are legal. Um, but that said, I, you know, I think that politics is the art of the possible. Um, so, you know, nine plants versus zero plants is a huge difference. And, mm -hmm. and I think if somebody, you know, this is my opinion, but if somebody is saying, uh, I'm not going to support nine plants because it's not enough. I would be a little bit skeptical of, of where they're coming from, because for most individual people, the ability to grow nine plants is the ability to grow more cannabis than you yourself are going to be uh, consuming over the course of a year, even if that's just nine outdoor plants um that are going to be harvested once a year never mind nine indoor plants where you can have a harvest every month or 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 so um so you know that debate is a healthy debate but i think if you have a real opportunity to pass home grow and the, and the other thing i would say to those people is great let's get nine plants uh authorized for people and then the day after that we can start pushing to raise it to 12 or raise it to 24. Um, but it, it is important to understand, you know, the need to um, play the politics, a, right? Yeah, yeah. Play the game. Mental when you have to. And, uh, you know, uh, people who, you know, we had a huge debate in California about the legalization law and um, I, I ended up voting for it and supporting it the, despite a lot of reservations about it and some of which certainly have come true. And it's been very hard on, you know, uh, particularly in Northern California, we have communities of people who are 
uh, even second and third generation small farmers um, and have been getting pushed out of the economy. Uh, but at the same time, ending these arrests is the most important thing. We, we, we just had an episode uh, on great moments in weed history where we interviewed a woman uh, from Humboldt County in California. I heard it, yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, back in the going back just a few decades, you had uh, these helicopter raids by the federal mm -hmm. and the state government. And these were people sometimes with 50 plants, which of course sounds like a lot if you are, uh, you know, just a lover of weed. But uh, in terms of commercial cultivation, it is a very, very small amount of plants. And yet, uh, the government, the war on drugs is out there flying helicopters to destroy people's tiny farms and, and tear their families apart. And uh, what was amazing in the episode was people locally up there got together. They started monitoring the police. They started their own uh, community radio station and would go on the air and say, hey, there's helicopters flying north towards this uh, part of the county, beware, there's a convoy of uh, police uh, vehicles heading up this road, be on watch and, and providing that kind of mutual uh, support for people. So, you know, when it when it comes to I, the other thing I'll say is anybody who's listening to this, who is involved in the illicit cultivation or distribution of this plant, please be careful please take those risks very very seriously it is up to you to make that decision for yourself but you have to understand the risks you have to take measures to protect yourself um, and and really the first responsibility of any revolutionary is not to get caught so uh, please bear all of that in mind whatever you decide to do even as so much as um, smoking a joint out on the street in a, in a prohibition place, you know, take that seriously because, you know, speaking as somebody who's been arrested for weed and somebody who has interviewed countless people who have been arrested for uh, growing, selling, distributing, smuggling, even just sharing this plant, um, you, you don't want to become a victim of this prohibition. You don't want to feed into their system and um, become another source of revenue for the police. You want to get away with it and, and you, you need to take that seriously. For everyone else, as I said, you know, when you look at these laws being written, that's a great number one question to ask. What about home grow? And if there's a group, if, if you are, uh, you know, go to a dispensary and they're part of a lobbying group and that lobbying group doesn't support home grow ask them why not and um you know push for that as a fundamental right where would you say is a good resource to find out um what lobbyists certain dispensaries are affiliated with where is that is, is that public information that's easily accessible um you know it's it, it'll take some google sleuthing but it, it's you know one you can ask them um, but, you know, I, I think the best way to do it is to kind of, you know, Google the name of the dispensary and business associations or lobbying groups and see what pops up. Um, there's an excellent website and resource called Marijuana Moment uh, that is, to me, you know, does some of the best journalism about cannabis and they follow this really closely. You know, your, your single one-off smaller dispensaries, uh, are, are not usually as involved in lobbying. They're more like a local liquor store, you know, they, mm -hmm. they're just a business. Um, but when you look at the big chains, uh, when you look at multi-state operators that have dispensaries in five or six, uh, different states, Truly. <laughs> yeah, they're going to be it's going to be much easier to find out information about them. And, uh, you know, you, you, you got you, you might have to do a little research, but it won't be mm -hmm. that hard to find out. Yeah, they actually the Truly actually has um, petitions in their dispensaries to support. Yeah, they actually the, support the, nine, the, the nine plant home home, the nine plant. Yeah, one. they actually do. It'd be great if there was like um like a website, like ethical 
you know, like the like they rate each company and their ethical like yeah. rating, like how they their products are made. How you know? I'm not sure. I feel like they do. They get reputation so too. Once you start talking to people in the biz, they know. Yeah, the word yeah, gets out. We, we've we've talked to people that have told us specific brands and how unethical they are, and you know, you just learn to steer clear, or you see like habits of the ways that they promote themselves too. And you can kind of tell by that as well. Yeah. And I think if you think of how far we've come, uh, food is a great example. Uh, you know, different people have a different relationship to the kind of food that they want to eat and where they, uh, whether they have an interest in how it was grown, if it's a plant or how an animal was raised and the consciousness around that has really come a long way. And, and not everybody is going to have the same concerns as you, um, you know, but it's important that that information is out there. And, and most importantly, the more vocal people are about it, the uh the market will respond to that you know if there is uh money to be made by doing it the right way and that uh is being expressed to these businesses then we will see more uh more of that represented on dispensary shelves well to switch gears i want to talk a little bit more about your podcast um how long have you guys been doing it now? How many episodes do you have? And how did you come up with the idea to start this podcast? Sure, thanks. We're uh, about four years into it. Uh, it is uh, co-hosted and co-produced with my partner on the podcast, Abdullah Saeed. Uh, we actually met uh, basically while working on a show for Vice called Bong Appetit. That's about food and weed. Uh, Abdullah was the host of that show, and I was a producer of the show, so working behind the scenes. Um, and we had many, many uh, wonderful times just kind of getting uh, getting blazed together and talking and, and waiting for them to get the cameras set up for the next shot. And we're always kind of telling each other weed stories. And so... Uh, that show as, was as awesome, too. That show was <laughs> oh, awesome. Thank you. Thank you. It was really fun. Um, and so... Uh, at the, you know, there was a point where I was working at high times and really felt that they were not a good representation in this community. They had new ownership come in. Um, you know, people could make their own decisions, but it was not something that I wanted to be involved in. We both uh, ended up really not wanting to work with Vice anymore. Uh, and we wanted to do something that we could do ourselves where we wouldn't have to raise a ton of money where we wouldn't have to give control over it to some outside party be simply because they were going to put the resources in um, and we both love podcasts we both love history we started uh we tried a, a few different formats for the podcast and as soon as we started talking about these great moments in weed history it just really felt like it clicked um and it really felt uh, like something that we could add to the conversation around cannabis and make sure uh, that this history is not uh, obscured or suppressed or rewritten um, and that we celebrate the people who, um, you know, fought for this culture. And, and it can be everything from our first episode was Willie Nelson got uh, smoked a joint on the roof of the White House. Um, and we also talk about people like uh, Dennis Perone and Brownie Mary, who were arrested and, and Dennis Perone was shot by the police simply for giving cannabis away to um, uh, people with AIDS and, and other people who were terminally ill. Um, and we also, you know, tell weed stories about people you might not know how to uh, a weed story like uh, the writer Maya Angelou. Her whole life was transformed by cannabis. And, you know, after we put that episode out, we heard from a lot of people who said, oh, she's my favorite author. And I never knew this about her. And, and that's partly because, you know, these stories about weed, anything positive about the plant has been uh, really suppressed from our understanding. So 
been uh, shadow banned from our undersea. <laughs> yes, just absolutely. like our, our social media. <laughs> ours, ours too. Um, so we have more than seventy original uh, history stories. If you go anywhere, you get podcasts to great moments in weed history, uh, and then just scroll through the feed and um, please check out an episode that appeals to you based on you know, whatever you might find interesting from the from the title and from the description. I've only just recently got into the podcast and I, I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoy it. I think it's fantastic. Um, how do you choose the stories that you're going to cover and like how much how long does it take you to research that that topic before you're ready for an episode? And does it? Yeah. Like- and how do you focus on capturing so much information? He's a journalist. Is what know, he does. Right? He's a writer. What are you? Is it? Is it the weed? What strain do you smoke, dude? <laughs> give me, give me. Well, my favorite strain is whatever you'd like to share with me. <laughs> the but, uh, um, you know, it can really vary. Some of you know, I, 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 I've been reporting on weed for twenty years, so. You know, whether it's something that I read, a story that somebody told me, um, something that I might have uh, experienced firsthand. And of course, we both come up with ideas for the show. Um, And then the research process. Some of the stories are, you know, kind of might be well documented somewhere else. and, and, And it's a matter of researching it and bringing the facts to light and getting it organized and and some of them all I, I will say are, are more obscure and, and require a lot of uh, research and then we sit down when we sit down to record uh, the show if I'm telling Abdullah the story when we start often he doesn't even know what the story is going to be about so knew it I was like that was going to be a question I was like does he know sometimes because his reactions are so genuine <laughs> yeah absolutely well he, of course he knows a lot about weed and and some of the stories he he knows uh the basic story going in because he's also been you know writing about weed and making media around weed for you know quite a while uh, but it, it, by by having him sit down fresh and not even know what the topic is going to be on a specific episode, it, you know, it does, I think, create some excitement and his reactions are all um, in real time. So it's a lot of fun. And then, you know, we put a, a lot of work into editing the stories and, and really trying to, um, you know, value people's time who are who are going to listen and and value uh these stories in and of themselves and and you know reflect how important we feel they are uh by by doing our our best to make them both educational and historical but also to you know have some fun and and some laughs along the way and and uh you know sometimes some of the best responses we get from listeners are people who are like hey, you know, I really don't have too many people to smoke with because of my life circumstances, whether I have to be secretive about it or maybe I moved to a new place or I just don't really have uh, a regular group of people to smoke weed with. And so listening to the show makes me um, feel that vibe. And then at the same time, I'm going to hear, uh, you know, these are incredible stories, you know, mm-hmm. uh, we, we, we have 10,000 years of weed history to pull from. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a labor of love. You know, we, we do, uh, love the people who support us on Patreon. We do love the, uh, people who sponsor the podcast, but I could definitely say, uh, this is a labor of love for the two of us. It's a reflection of our friendship. You know, now we live in two different places, so it's a great opportunity for us to get together uh, and 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 have a good time ourselves. So it's it's uh, four years in. Um, it's 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 been a wonderful experience. We're starting to do live shows. We have a live show coming up uh, September 10th in Portland, Oregon. If anybody listening is Ooh. is around there and. Um, you know, that's been another really fun aspect of this. I, I, I really enjoy uh, getting out, doing the shows live in front of an audience, getting to meet people after. And uh, it's it's always very good vibes. I would love to go to a live show. I, I, I really enjoy I I like because sometimes you guys have guests on who are people are involved in whatever history moment you're discussing, which are great also. But I really enjoy 
when you tell the story and Abdul like reacts, I think it's it's really fun I, and entertaining to listen to. I and I don't understand why you tell everybody to pause to go smoke because I'm just smoking while I'm listening. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, this is at this great. point, <laughs> at this point, they need to it's know like, what the protocol is. Yeah, like no pause, keep going, let's go. Yeah, it's protocol. You guys should know by now. Like, what's up? We we just go for it. We're like, if you got it, just blaze it up. But um, I actually, I saw Abdullah on uh, on a bong appetit. And then when we started doing the podcast, you know, like I was like, well, who's out there doing what? I mean, like I kind of always look out like before I started doing stand up comedy, I started looking and seeing who's doing it and what's, you know, to kind of like see what the scene is. You guys rolled up and I was like, oh, I started digging into your podcast and I was like, oh, I recognize this guy from this show. And it was well, we we had vice like for a moment. And I had seen the show and I was like, my God, this is insane. It's like so scientific and it's so, so like, I don't know when, you know, when you think of weed, you don't think how much goes into it, right? Until you really start diving in and you start seeing how much really goes into it. And I I saw that show and I was like, wow, this isn't even just like a show about eating food with weed in it it's like how do you do it how does it happen how do yeah how does all of it work I thought that was amazing and then we started doing the podcast and I found uh great moments in weed history and I was like yo (laughs) this is phenomenal and then so much of your journalism and so much of you just you go you dive in so deep that it's like I mean, it's just, it's a good combination. Oh, thank you. Well, I, I very much appreciate that. And, and and you both have a really great vibe with each other. And I think that's, you know, a big part of what makes a successful podcast is, uh, you know, people want to feel uh, those good vibes. And, um, you know, I really appreciate your show. And I really appreciate um, the message that you're putting out about responsible parenting and cannabis and, you know, I don't need to tell you how uh, frustrating it is to live in a society where, uh, you know, people are free to drink alcohol and uh, take prescription drugs and do whatever they're going to do. And that's all fine. And there's still all even in legal states, all of this stigma around cannabis and parenting when in many, many cases, um, it, it can really enhance people's experience of being a parent, uh, particularly if you're saying, well, I'm going to do this instead of drink. Um, you know, I'm not against alcohol. I enjoy a little alcohol myself, but I don't think anybody can make an argument that you're better off as a parent uh, drinking than you are uh, responsibly consuming cannabis. Um, and that's a message that is, uh, you know, not as 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 accepted as it should be you know i did put a little section even in my book about it because i've talked with so many people who said yeah it it, it not only is you know better than alcohol it can really help people be more um in tune with themselves And, and and you know i'm not a parent myself but if you're in tune with yourself and you reach some level of comfort with yourself and if you're able to manage your stress, and if you're able to have fun because of cannabis, well, that's going to be reflective in your in your relationship with your children. And so I think um, putting that right in the title of your podcast, I think representing those millions and millions of parents who feel the same way is, is a really great public service. And I, I appreciate you, you both doing it. Thanks. Well, I mean, like you said, like people and and we're lucky to have kind of grown up within the same social circle and have been friends smoking weed, having kids around the same time. We do our podcast and there's so many moms out there who are like scared to talk to people about their use. They don't have people to smoke with. They don't have friends to smoke with. We feel like, my God, we've this is so lucky. There's so many people out there who like they do tune in to kind of 
have that community because they're not able to have that outside of their home, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And then you're, you're you know, you're getting uh, looked down on by by somebody with a with a toddler in one hand, a, a giant glass of wine, uh, liquor or wine in the other and a, and even a cigarette, you know, mm-hmm. and, and then, you know, I'm not judging people who, who do whatever, as long as you're responsible in your parenting. But right. The hypocrisy is, is certainly um, beyond obvious to anybody who really understands this plant and, and how it affects people. And you can listen to great moments in weed history podcast as well. Uh, go to their web- website, greatmomentsinweedhistory.com. On Instagram, they are at GMIWH podcast. Yeah, and- you guys should really check out the podcast. It is definitely one of my favorite ones to listen yeah, to. It's fantastic. So- Take us out of here, Captain J. <gasps> With the theme.